to just demonstrate how real this is. We've had businesses come to us who've had total loss of their entire system. Hello everyone, I'm Adam Turton and welcome to Elite Chat. In each of our episodes, I'm joined by guest speakers as we explore the impact of emerging trends and dive into the different challenges facing businesses today. Our hope is that we can bring you some value on your journey in business by sharing the knowledge and practical experiences of our guests who have operated and executed successfully in business. Today, we will be diving into the world of cybersecurity, which is a very hot topic right now and something that every business is wrestling with as the implications for businesses suffering any kind of security threat or data breach are massive. Joining me today to explore this subject in further detail is Phil Scanlon and Ian Grobler. Phil Scanlon brings 35 years experience in providing IT solutions to businesses and running IT consultancy and IT services companies. Phil is a cloud evangelist who's been driving the cloud conversation for over 20 years now, even before it's known as cloud. Phil is very much focused on helping businesses better understand cloud technology and improve their cybersecurity. Ian Grobler brings over 30 years experience in designing cloud and IT infrastructure solutions. Spent the last five years working very closely with Microsoft on 365 and Azure services. Very technical and an IT engineer at heart, fully qualified to talk about security services with us today. Hello, Phil and Ian, welcome to Elite Chat. Thank you, Adam. So diving straight in, gents, certainly uh, cybersecurity is a hot topic at the moment. I think it's been pretty well documented and covered in the news. It literally feels like there's a new high profile cybersecurity breach that's, that's impacted big businesses breaking in the news every other day. I think just to get things started and, and Phil coming to you first on this one, please, what would you say at the moment the most common cybersecurity threats are that are impacting businesses at the moment? I'd say the most common uh, out there today is targeted ransomware and extortion attacks where cyber criminals steal your business data and then publish the stolen data on either the dark web or, or use it to hold businesses to ransom. Um, so that, I would say that is the number one uh, threat, biggest threat at the moment, the most common. And just to advance on that a little bit, Phil, sticking with you, how, how real is that threat, like as we're sat here right now today, and businesses across the world, like how imminent and real is that threat of ransomware attacks? It's absolutely real. Um, you know, we, we're in contact with businesses at, at least, you know, I'd say every week we hear of a business that has, you know, suffered quite a big loss or been held to ransom um, or, or has had a huge uh, amount of data uh, stolen um, and then published on public networks. So yeah, it's real. It's absolutely real, um, and we're seeing you know it's on the rise as well, and and it's getting it's getting more and more targeted. Absolutely, and Ian, I think given this, how real this, and how real and how imminent this threat is around ransomware and other cybersecurity threats, how important is it for businesses to invest in cybersecurity solutions? Um, I think it's very important that businesses do invest in cybersecurity solutions on the basis of what Phil's just mentioned. Um, there's a massive amount of risk in terms of GDPR, reputational uh, to organizations, and it's really, really uh, causing a huge amount of problems for, for the industry as, as a whole. Uh, not only for us to support these customers, but these businesses that have to react to actual cybersecurity attacks. It takes a huge amount of manpower, time, money uh, to recover from something like this. So the investment made is very, very much worthwhile. Makes sense. So let's dive into that a little bit then for the business owners and IT professionals who, who might be watching this. I'm thinking specifically now about the cybersecurity solutions and the technology that's out there that can potentially help businesses and organizations. Phil, just coming to you on this one first, please. What are the current and emerging trends regarding cybersecurity solutions that are available on the market? So um, I'd say the, the, the most important uh, current emerging trends are 
really around uh, the ransomware piece and the ransomware attacks where, you know, through the COVID-19 health crisis, we've, we've actually seen an increase in cyber criminals adopting a more social engineering approach. So, so what this means is, is this is targeted email attacks where they're sending personalized messages to individuals, usually employees within a, a business who have access to sensitive information or even access to things like the company's bank accounts and so on and so forth. So, you know, we're, we're seeing that cyber criminals now will, will sift through things like social engines, you know, the social networks to find out more information around individuals. And then they'll base their targeted attacks on a lot of the information that they've found. They'll also try and get access to your public uh, email accounts because, you know, most people these days have a, a Google account or, a, or, or, or an Outlook account, a free, you know, online account, which at the end of the day, you know, uh, they're, they're a huge risk and people get access, you know, criminals get access to those. It's quite easy to, you think about what kind of information is sat in your own mailbox. Once they get access to that, it's very easy to start thinking about how how they can impersonate you or, or even target you uh, for, for some of the information that's in there. Understood, and Ian, given what Phil said there, what are the key cybersecurity solutions and precautions then that a, that a business leader should look to prioritise, in your opinion? Thanks, Adam. Well, from that point of view, I don't know if you remember last week, the White House released an open letter urging business leaders worldwide to step up their cybersecurity efforts. And obviously, the recent wave of ransomware attacks that have hit critical infrastructure is partly responsible for this. But I think one of the key messages out of that, uh, uh, an excerpt out of the actual letter itself, says that uh, business leaders need to immediately convene their leadership teams and discuss ransomware threats, as well as review corporate security posture and business continuity plans to ensure that they have the ability to continue or quickly restore operations. And I think I can't, you know, I cannot agree more with the statement. The key precaution for businesses um, is to accept that it's only a matter of time rather than when an attack will take place. And if the business leaders take the stance with cybersecurity and look at cybersecurity solutions as a whole, um, you know, that'll massively help protect those businesses um, against, you know, the cybersecurity threats. Great, thank you. And, and Phil, coming to you now and thinking about potential starting point for businesses, what's the best way for businesses to assess the strength of their cybersecurity protection? What, what questions do they need to be asking and answering in their organisation? Well, I think because cybersecurity is so complex and complicated, it's, it's now more than just uh, antivirus or soft, smart software on the desktop. It's now, you know, it's become personal and individuals, as I was saying earlier, individuals are getting targeted. So there's, there's more to cybersecurity now than just buying software and ticking a box. It's more about the communication across the business and how you actually, um, how you deliver those, uh, you know, how you protect your employees against attack and how you protect their data as well. So I would be saying the first thing any organization needs to do is, is perform a simple cybersecurity risk assessment on your own business. And can either do that yourself, or if you're, you know, if any business owner is not sure how to do that, or worried there might be holes and gaps in, in what they look at, then engage with an organization, you know, like Elite, who can help you and support you do that. The other thing I would say is, you know, a business should really look at obtaining um, something like the Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus certificate. You know, that's a government-backed scheme that helps organizations protect their own data. It, it helps you to look internally and helps you ask the right questions. And these are, you know, they're not very expensive things to do um, and, and, and are very, very effective when implemented properly. And again, like I say, you know, an organization like Elite Group can help small businesses or any, any business really look at the cyber essentials uh, certification and help you work through it because like I say that's a really effective tool uh, to, to use in, in all businesses.
So I would be strongly recommending that businesses take that up. Thanks, Phil. And then building on, I guess, some of the points that Phil's made there, Ian, what technologies, therefore, should businesses be looking to invest in? And I guess what, what technologies should they look, look to avoid in order to start to consider keeping their data and their technology platform secure? I think in terms of avoidance, I suppose having tool, any tool, is better than no tool. Yeah. Um, so in other words, when you look at, at the traditional solutions that are on the market and available, uh, traditional antivirus, et cetera, you know, they still have a role to play in the overall cybersecurity landscape. Um, you know, new of, uh, a newer take on looking at security, you know, principles of zero trust, for example, you know, are, are, are methodologies that'll help uh, if you apply these throughout the business um, and implementing, um, you know, zero trust without hindering people, obviously, in, in doing their work, uh, you know, a, a play a great role in, in, in strengthening a business's security posture. Um, in terms of compromised credentials, this is still probably the biggest threat to businesses today. You know, so when you talk about investing in, in technologies, you know, multi-factor authentication is probably still one of the single most effective ways of mitigating security risk. Uh, you know, invents, investing in, in, in comprehensive EDR tools, you know, endpoint detection, response, you know, uh, traditional perimeter security, they all play a role in strengthening the overall landscape. Um, so as I mentioned, there's no real tools to avoid, um, but really looking at the security solution from an end-to-end -end point of view and investing wisely in those in those tools is 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 definitely a uh, positive to any business. In addition, obviously there is cloud. Looking at organisations mostly today are hybrid in some shape or form. Cloud provides a lot of benefits in terms of having a lot of uh, security technology already embedded in that infrastructure. So taking advantage of cloud sort of provides. Uh, you know, some sort of direct benefit in terms of strengthening security posture. And as Phil said, assist with things like Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus when you move into, into some of the cloud provider space. Thanks, Ian. And I'm sure, you know, the business owners and IT professionals watching this will, will get, gain some value from the tips and advice and, and the direction both you and Phil are pointing them in the, as a start point. I think obviously we're very lucky to have you both joining us today. There's a hell of a lot of experience and, and knowledge um, sat in front of me right now, which is um, which is a privilege for, for me and, and for everybody that's that's watching. And I know that you guys have got a lot of experience working with different businesses of all shapes and sizes, small, medium, large enterprise organizations. But thinking specifically now about, I guess, business startups, entrepreneurs looking to start a business. And Phil, coming to you here, because I know you've, You've ran your own companies in the past. What what security issues should business owners prepare for when first setting up a business? So I would say uh, any modern business starting up today, um, I, I would be very much recommending to you know the owner or the manager and director of that business to adopt a cloud-first strategy for all the business applications. You will find that you know. Delivering cloud-first strategy within your business, you will find that you know inherently most cloud applications these days have a lot of security built into it, into the services that you know would would traditionally cost a small business a lot of money to deploy internally or on your own servers or on your own systems. So I would say you know look to adopt cloud-first strategy for all your business applications, whether that's CRM, accountancy, finance. Um, payroll, whatever it is that your business needs to run and operate, use the cloud, uh, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Buy smart, you know. I always say to small businesses, buy smart. It doesn't cost a lot of money to have a very good and secure email system. It doesn't cost a great deal of money to put in two-factor authentication, as as Ian has suggested. It doesn't cost a lot of money to put in, and you know, good endpoint protection. Um, and these are some of the real basics. So look to the cloud, because a lot of the services out there are a heck of a lot more secure than, than most businesses will ever even contemplate delivering, you know, either within their own premises or on their own systems. Yeah, thanks, Phil. I know obviously you touched on two-factor authentication 
there and and really hit home the the idea and the concept of a cloud first strategy but just building on on those ideas slightly Ian and again focusing on business startups first time business owners of the vast number of options that are available from a technology perspective as a priority which which technology options sort of should a a business owner look to adopt from a security point of view when adopting a cloud first um, technology strategy in the new business startup well, I think it's important for business to look at which providers are going to provide them with a comprehensive, as I mentioned, end-to-end, uh, you know, strategy as well as 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 journey in in regards to security as well as the services that they provide. Um, you know, from from our experience, you know, there are really very few players in the industry that can offer that full end-to-end um, solution stack. Uh, you know, one of the big, uh, big players that everybody knows about is Microsoft. Um, you know, the solutions that they offer are comprehensive throughout, um, you know, both from the endpoint through to, uh, you know, providing the infrastructure in the cloud. When you adopt products such as Office, you get a huge amount of security options in these products. Uh, you know, data loss protection. There's, there's many, many technologies that make up the ecosystem that allows an organization to really improve their security posture. So from my, from my perspective is, yeah, look at what the offering is. Yes, there are many, many cloud isolated cloud providers for applications and they provide a specific service. But when you look at the overall solution offering, really there are only a few players that can provide you with, uh, you know, this real technology that you need uh, to, to get secure and stay secure. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And I guess a question I, I did want to ask, and I'm sure it's one you come across quite often, Phil, certainly in your experience of talking to businesses, it's about it's about budgets and setting a budget for um, security um, and the protection of data and, and, and IT systems. So you know, in your experience, I mean, how do you answer that question? How much should a business look to spend on cybersecurity, taking into consideration the different budget constraints small local businesses, charitable non-profit organizations, you've got SMEs, large enterprises. How does a an IT professional in an organization have that conversation with the FD, the CFO, to, to, to lead them and guide them on how much uh, they should be budgeting and spending on cybersecurity? Re- really interesting question now. How much should I be spending to protect my business? It's, it's a difficult one. There isn't a simple answer, I'm afraid. However, um, you know, you've got, you've got to understand that I mean, some, somebody like Gartner did a, a huge uh, piece of work last year in actually looking into how much businesses spend on cybersecurity. And, you know, while there isn't a one figure fits all, there's definitely, a, a, you know, the, what the report that Gartner produced was really pointed out the fact that businesses aren't spending anywhere near enough money on security. Um, but then again, you know, it's relatively cheap. It's not, it's, it's relatively inexpensive for a business to, to start their journey and build a really good foundation for cyber security within their business. For example, you know, we mentioned the cyber essential certificate, a government backed scheme. It costs 300 pounds to gain the certificate. And that takes you through a really good, quite an, an extensive process where you actually look internal to your business. And 300 pounds is, is not a lot of money um, in, in the scale of things when you look at you know, what a GDPR cost, uh, breach could cost a business. So while there isn't one size fits all for, for every business, you, know, you can start as, as little as 300 pounds to get a, a, cyber, a cyber essential certificate. And you can spend, you know, we know businesses that spend thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds a, a week on cyber security. It all depends on the applications. It depends on, you know, your risk, your attack surface, how big the risk is for your business. In your experience, I guess both documented in the news, but also from customers you may have had some experiences with, I'm not asking you to name them. What have been some of the most severe implications that you've seen, you know, in terms of the impact of a a data breach or a ransomware attack, you know, both financially, reputation, all those kinds of things. What's how, how severe have those implications been in your experience with some businesses? 
Um, I'll, I'll go first with that. Yeah. I'm sure Ian can back up some examples, but you know, to, to, to just demonstrate how real this is, we've had businesses come to us who had total loss of their entire systems, fully encrypted, including the backup. So these kind of ransomware attacks are real. They cripple a the business. Just to recover from those can take weeks, months. Some businesses don't recover, you know, and we've seen businesses that have you know, imagine walking into the office one morning and you you no longer have any data. You yeah. no longer have access to your, all your company files, your company account system. It, it's devastating and can absolutely ruin a business. So, you know, it's very tempting to actually look at paying the ransom because yeah. some businesses will fail um, if they can't get their data back. So, you know, and we, and we see that, we see it regularly. Um, again, we can't name names, but you know, this is real and it does happen. I'm sure Ian's got some examples of what that might look like in the real world without naming specific business names. Ian, you had anything to add there in terms of your experience and what you've seen in terms of the implications that, you know, a serious ransomware or, or cybersecurity threats had on businesses? Yeah, uh, I mean, in terms of, of what um, Phil mentioned, it's um, potentially hours, weeks, days of downtime that is involved when when uh, you know when you get a specific set of ransomware and ransomware demands. Um, the impact really is uh, is dramatic um, when you've lost everything, including your data backups. It's a very very difficult position to recover from, uh, you know, unless you have some sort of air gap solution where uh, you, you know, you've strictly followed the three to one type backup rules that are, are prevalent in the industry. Um, the recovering from something like that is massively, massively time consuming and expensive. Uh, and in many cases, the ransom that's requested, uh, you know, to decrypt the data is less than what the costs are to actually rebuild and recreate data from scratch. And in many cases, the data can't get recreated anyway. Um, you know, there's a lot of specific key information that is lost uh, when such an attack occurs. Uh, so the impact is dramatic. Um, the organizations that we've dealt with, we, you know, we've, we've seen, um, you know, a dip in business, uh, reputational, um, as well as just the fact that, uh, you know, simple things that you would think, you know, invoicing, uh, being able to bring in money, uh, process orders. You might have a whole warehouse full of goods, but you can't ship the goods because you've got no processing systems to be able to move that with. Uh, the, the impact is very dramatic and it's, uh, it's actually a very sad state of affairs of where we are at this time. So I guess a key message or a key summary when we're talking about deciding on a budget to commit to security and protecting your data and your, and your business systems, it's really about considering what's the What's the cost associated with not being able to function your business for a day or a week? And what's the cost of having to roll back and invoke disaster recovery and, and rebuild servers and, and repopulate so. data, et cetera? So I think you've got to probably consider those things alongside the budget that you submit into an FD or a CFO to understand whether or not it's in context. Is that, is that a fair summary? I would say that's definitely true. I mean, I've had many conversations with customers over the year, you know, over the years uh, where we, even if you're talking about simply just backups, you know, air gap backups, tape backup, uh, you know, tape is dead, uh, backup into the cloud. Uh, there's various different scenarios that can uh, ensure that, you know, you do have some method of recovery uh, should something go wrong. Uh, but in many cases, those conversations, once they ended up on the FD's desk, were, you know, declined in any shape or form. You know, we'll invest in it next year. There's not enough money this year. And invariably, unfortunately, in some cases, those same organizations actually were attacked, have had some form of ransomware or data loss. Uh, you know, and the question then comes back, well, why didn't you warn us? What is the situation? You know, and, and, and it really is... Um, a strong message to organizations that, you know, make those investments. If there's significant cost involved to the business for downtime, then then the investment you make should reflect that cost. If you're going to be, you know, if you're a charity, 
you're a small business, you know, there's no huge financial impact. You may be able to afford to be down for six, 12, 24 hours, or even a couple of days. But a business that might be turning over huge amounts of cash and lose potentially, you know, thousands, millions of pounds a day, week, you know, an investment in your cyber securities is, is probably a very small percentage. And it gives you, to, to some extent, an, ex, an insurance policy, um, you know, that helps at least mitigate against that risk of losing so much, uh, you know, income due to, you know, a, a, an event that may have occurred. So, yes, very strongly recommend uh, an appropriate investment in, in your cybersecurity protection. Thanks, Ian. Makes, makes complete sense. Um, I did want to talk to you both about the impact of remote working and, and hybrid working alongside this subject matter. Obviously, given COVID-19 over the last, what, 18 months or whatever it may be, something like four years worth of digital transformation was, was forced upon us all within a, a space of four months as we all embarked upon remote working at scale, not just in this country, but across the globe. And, and now we find ourselves in a position where restrictions are starting to lift and businesses are wrestling with hybrid working due to the success of the vaccination rollout in the UK. So Phil, coming to you first, really, in terms of what all this means within the cybersecurity threat landscape, what, what major security threats are posed when businesses offer remote and hybrid working? So remote working means that employees need to gain access to the business systems outside of the safety, I suppose, of an internal network. Most businesses have usually have a premise, you know, they have premises where people go and sit at desk and you connect or log in to your network. As soon as you, you adopt remote working, it means that your employees need access to these systems effectively over the internet. And now the internet is a public, you know, we, we class it as a public network. In other words, you have no control over that network. It's very difficult to, to protect everything that you do over that network. So it's absolutely imperative that all the information that travels across the public network when you're accessing com company data and company systems is encrypted. It's got to be encrypted. You know, Ian mentioned that earlier that uh, multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication is a really, really um, important weapon in the, in, in, in the fight against cyber uh, security. So, you, you know, as soon as we have to start considering employees are working outside of the, the internal network, that's where we have to then focus on, well, actually, what are they accessing? How do they access it? It opens a whole new realm of how to gain access to your business systems over the internet, because that's effectively what we're doing. Yeah. So it's, it's looking at things like making sure that we're adopting the right encryption technologies, making sure that you know, if people are accessing data, how is that accessed over the internet? Are they accessing it via VPNs? How secure is the local device? Because the local device is effectively attached to the internet. Most people's broadband lines at home, you know, with all due respect, we don't really have great firewalls at, at home. We have a basic firewall that provides a level of security that we would, we, we would expect to use while we're working from home. It, it's not, you know, it's not a, of, a, of a business grade, if you will. So we have to start thinking more about how do we protect the end user's device, so the laptop, the desktop? What tools do we need on that? Is it encrypted? How do we access, how are they accessing their information? What are they storing on that laptop? How are they accessing emails? Are the emails all synchronized and, and, uh, and stored on, on those devices? So it opens up a whole new area of threats that we have to assess and, and really look at protect, you know, protecting the business from. Thanks, Phil. Really valuable um, insight there. In coming to you, and I know Ian, you spoke recently at a webinar about um, the power and the capability from a security perspective that exists within Microsoft Azure. And I'm thinking really now about the role that cloud and cloud technology can play as part of security in a hybrid working setting. Can you, can you bring that to life, please? How businesses can utilize the cloud for secure hybrid working? Yes, Adam. Um, well, uh, 
to me, it's all about data, um, you know, and where that data is located and who has access to that data. Um, so when we talk about cloud services, uh, you know, uh, things like Windows Virtual Desktop, uh, SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, all these technologies that are available to us from, from companies like Microsoft, allow us to store our business and company data online, but in a secure manner. Uh, in other words, there are protections on the back end, protections through Office, through the Azure services, denial of service protections um, that help us protect that data. In addition, you know, as an organization, you can invest in um, up, upscaling the Office licenses you may have to include things like Azure information protection, uh, um, as well as, as the Office components, uh, uh, things like Azure Defender, Office Defender, and all of these products, as I mentioned, are form part of, a, of an ecosystem and help us protect that data. And, and, and the key thing is it, it focuses not only on the user, in other words, things like MFA, uh, you know, identity management, that sort of thing. It also focuses on the actual devices themselves as well, managing those devices, you know, putting in some form of security consideration to make sure that these devices actually comply before they can access the company network. You know, do they have the latest Windows updates or do they have actual antivirus protection enabled? You know, as if they don't have these sort of criteria or don't comply with criteria, you can buy access. Um, so there's many things that the clouds give you that, <laughs> that the cloud gives you, um, which enable you to really give you, implement this zero trust model as well as protect, you know, user and devices. And then there's implementing protections on the actual data itself. In other words, you can enable things like data loss protection, encrypt your documents, classify them, um, make sure that, you know, what you consider company confidential information isn't shared with another organization, even if a copy is made or it's unintentionally emailed to somebody else. So there's many, many layers, um, you know, and, and, and these are available to the smallest of businesses all through to the enterprise. The key fact is that, you know, the cloud plays a key role in, in, in being able to uh, enable these and enforce these sort of policies. Very, very powerful indeed. Thanks Ian. And I mean, something I wanted to talk about, we, we've referred to ransomware um, throughout today's session, but also GDPR compliance and, and, and that minefield. I wanted to touch both on ransomware and GDPR. So we, we do hear a lot about ransomware in the media Phil, I wanted to ask you really, how can businesses protect themselves from a ransomware attack? So, so Adam, for businesses to protect themselves against uh, ransomware attacks, it's really about putting in some basic security tools. So, you know, products like Office 365 come with a, a number of great cyber security tools built into them to help businesses in the fight against cyber cyber attacks, but you know, adopting some of those basic technologies, multi-factor authentication, endpoint security management, you know, antivirus, anti-malware, they all sound really basic, but good effective tools really do work. Um, I'd also say that a big part of it is because of the social engineering aspect of, of attacks these days is, you know, businesses need to train staff on how to identify uh, these kind of attacks and how they work and how they operate. So these are attacks that, you know, can almost look like your, you know, we've, we've just recently seen um, a, a business um, who's been under attack from cyber criminals who have been uh, effectively spoofing their directors' mobile phone numbers. So sending texts to staff from a number that appears to be the managing director's mobile those kind of things so it's about you know it's not just about the tools as we we're saying earlier it is more about it's just as much about training your staff to identify those those issues training your staff to identify attacks being suspicious of all things like external emails you know one of the one of the basic things you can do with email is is have a banner appear across all your external emails so any email that comes from an external source, have a simple banner so that you know it's come from an external source, then at least then you can identify, you know, if it's if it's the managing director asking you to transfer um, phones or go and buy certain 
products and services for you, then, you know, and you realize that, you know, it's worth checking, always double check, is this actually from the person that, it's, that it appears to be from? Pick up the phone, it might be a, even an external supplier. Pick up the phone, speak to them, just confirm these kind of things. And you can only do that by educating the staff, teaching them what to look for and how to identify these things. That's just as important as the antivirus, the anti-malware, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, really, really great answer there. And then, Ian, just thinking about GDPR compliance specifically, I know it's a subject matter that, that a lot of businesses will have been wrestling with now for, for a number of years. What, what cybersecurity solutions can businesses invest in to facilitate GDPR compliance? There's a number of cybersecurity solutions a business can invest in from a technical point of view to improve GDPR compliance. Uh, one of those, for example, is encryption. You know, that is something that technically is uh, seen as a, as a very good mitigating factor in terms of protecting data. Uh, and this is not just encrypting data at rest or encrypting data on hard drives in SAN. Uh, it's talking about encrypting data in transit, as Phil mentioned, you know, being transferred across the internet, as well as within applications themselves as well. So encryption is one of those key technologies that really makes a big difference in terms of GDPR compliance. A number of EDR solutions also provide what they call data protection elements. Uh, so what they can do is scan, uh, you know, endpoints uh, that an organization might have for data that could be, you know, construed as being sensitive. Uh, in other words, this is personally identifiable information, credit card numbers, national insurance numbers. A lot of people have documents on their laptops or, you know, or possibly even in, in uh, you know, accidentally saved USB sticks, etc., that may contain this information. They may not even be aware that it's there. Um, and a lot of the EDR solutions that are available on the market, especially the good ones today, can scan for these sort of things and help you, you know, identify these as, as risk, uh, as posing an exfiltration risk, and therefore help again in, in, in identifying it, cleaning it up, um, and, and therefore reducing your risks in terms of GDPR. Um, so there's many, many ways of, of helping to, you know, to facilitate your GDPR compliance by investing in, in technology. Great, thanks Ian, and we are nearly out of time now, so I'm going to come to you both for some final thoughts and just a couple of questions to help draw today's session to a close. Phil, coming to you first, what does the future of cybersecurity look like? What are your predictions for the future of cyber threats as, as technology advances? I think where cyber criminals are focusing their efforts today is really on targeted attacks that's where we're seeing huge increases in in not just attacks but in the success rate of those attacks yeah so you know as, uh, those targeted attacks usually uh you know are very uh, have a high chance of success because you know cyber criminals now are, are you know, there's so much information out there about individuals be it on social media be it um in public, uh, publicly accessible uh, data sources, um, and also available, you know, in places like the dark web. So, I would say that, you know, the future, what the future looks like from a, a cybersecurity aspect, is more and more targeted social engineering types type attacks. Ransomware is on the rise. It is going to continue. It's not going away it's very, very difficult to protect. You know, there isn't one solution, you, there isn't one button you click to fix all ransomware attacks. It's a multi-layered approach and it's also education as well as we spoke about earlier. So, you know, the future really is, is more and more sophisticated attacks yeah. focused, targeted specifically to individuals within a business. Um, and that's where we, where we see, you know, the, the future. Ian, do you agree with Phil's outlook and future predictions on what the cyber security and the, the threat landscape looks like? Yeah, very much so. Um, I think in terms of, 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 of what we're going to see is definitely much more of a, a targeted approach. Um, and I think from a business point of view, you know, how we can ensure that we probably stay safe is to 
continue to leverage cloud. Um, there's a lot of AI technology in the cloud that will allow us to, you know, to automate sensing, if you can call it the word, you know, sensing these attacks because it, it attacks us of, you know, they multi, they multi uh, 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 pronged. In other words, you know, something is compromised. It spreads through the network. It normally takes a few days or a week or two. Businesses don't realize when they've been compromised. It, it's normally a, a, a slow process and one piece builds on another. As Phil mentioned, mobile phones, transfers, in whatever shape or form, phishing or direct compromise. And, and investing in, you know, in, in again, you know, the cloud and having that sort of power behind you. When we look at CM, you know, the tools that automate, gather the information, those will be the tools that help protect us to some extent against these isolated targeted bits of attack and, and, and sort of bring the data together and say, you know what, you know, something happened over here, something happened over there and something happened over there. If we correlate that information, you've got a breach on your hands, but normally looking at it, it wouldn't flag anything. You know, suddenly there's a huge amount of data flowing out of my network. Why is that? You know, and this, this is the sort of tools we're going to have to rely on to protect us going forward. Thanks, Ian. Um, just a, a minefield of an, an area and a subject matter to explore, but we are going to have to leave it there. We are out of time. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Ian, for making the time to share your thoughts and, and, and knowledge with us today. Hopefully this episode and the content has brought you some value as you navigate the challenges associated with cybersecurity. Let us know what you think, please, by leaving a comment or a question, and we will absolutely be sure to reply to that. If today's episode did bring you some value, all we ask is that you please do share it with your connections and your network on your chosen social media platforms. Thank you all for tuning in and see you next time.